Thanks, Jung. We're good. Yes. Um, I'd like to welcome up to the stage Mr. Sung Young, uh, Su Young Park, the President and CEO of NIPA. Yeah, uh, this is Su Young Park. I'm a CEO of a uh, national IT promotion agency. Uh, I know uh, we have a lot of things to do this afternoon, so I'll shorten my talk like uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, 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 basically, uh, NIPA is, uh, we are trying to promote IT companies in Korea from uh, making policy for IT and also supporting their marketing also some R&D, also a uh, pilot project for the future technology. Uh, so uh, we try to organize this uh, uh, conference uh, to stimulate uh, Korean IT companies and uh, United States IT companies so that they can have uh, some networks and so that they can have uh, some more uh, business opportunity. So I wish uh, success of this K conference and I wish we have a fruitful result and continue to next year. Thank you. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Liz Gans, who will be moderating our next panel um, for the afternoon. So Liz Gans has been a Silicon Valley-based business technology reporter since 2004, where she started her career with Red Herring. And she was a second employee at the technology blog network, I'm sure we've all heard of GigaOM, and where she has covered the rise of the social web. So as part of GigaOM in 2006, Ms. Scans founded New TV, a site that became the preeminent source for news and analysis about internet video, and ultimately the intersection of entertainment and technology. She graduated from Dartmouth with a degree in linguistics. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Liz Gaines, reporter with All Things Digital, um, and glad to be here. Uh, hopefully we can be interesting for the next hour, maybe a little bit less. Um, telling, uh, with, with, the, with these three guys here sitting on stage who look at a lot of um, early stage companies and opportunities and maybe have a little bit of a window in the future through um, all the people that they're talking to. Um, I'll let you, you introduce yourselves and not have to sit through someone else talking about you like I just did. <laughs> sure. Uh, Mark Shedroff, uh, Samsung, and I work in the Open Innovation Center. Hi, I'm Gus Tai with Trinity Ventures. Uh, I invest in very early stage companies, a lot on the consumer side, but also on the technology infrastructure and software infrastructure. Hi, I'm Warren Weiss. I'm a general partner at Foundation Capital early stage uh, venture firm, and I focus on really anything in the software, IT cloud infrastructure space. I've done a bit of digital investing in the energy business in the past, uh, and I'm glad to be here. Just give us a sense of what stage of startups you primarily work with. So uh, I'm happy to go first. So within Open Innovation Center, we have four teams. Uh, the, the four groups are one, a commercial partnerships team, two, an M&A team uh, looking at acquiring companies, three, a ventures group, and then fourth, we have these um, accelerators that we've set up. Uh, I'll put aside the accelerators because those are really product development uh, organizations for us, but in the commercial partnership side, M&A side, and venture side, it really spans um, the full spectrum. On the partnership side, we will work with later stage companies. Uh, but certainly on the venture side, where we do investments anywhere from 500000 to $3 million in a company, tends to be very early stage. And then even acquisitions, the focus for us today at least has been more around talent. So it might be a company that's been around for a little while, um, but largely we'd look at small teams where we can bring that expertise in-house. Yeah, and, and for us, Liz, uh, the majority of our investments are, uh, are pre-revenue. So... I would say that two-thirds of the companies we fund are pre-revenue. We'll spend time funding companies and help folks uh, found those companies. So, for example, M-Spot, which was purchased by Samsung, was something that had two employees, and we helped uh, early on with that. Uh, and we lead most of our institutional rounds. Yeah, it's, uh, our firms are pretty similar. So uh, uh, the probably most extreme example is to take something like uh, wireless computing uh, with a company called Atheros that's now owned by Qualcomm. It was a Stanford 
professor that came up with an idea to put radio on a CMOS chip, and she spent two years in the basement of our building and created the dominant uh, wireless uh, chip company in the world. So um, usually very small pre-revenue teams. Okay. It strikes me that one of the more interesting um, and larger scale um, by definition phenomena going right on right now is that the audience for technology is just increasing and it's, it's huge, it's everyone, right? And so I wonder how that affects how you look at um, investments um, both on the consumer side, but also just because anything you're dealing with that does well is at such an, an immense scale. Is yeah, that I, a change I mean, for you, or is it just you know more and bigger? Yeah, I, I guess what, what, what struck me, Liz, with that comment with respect to the interest that I suspect some of you had, the two trends that I think um, are really being impacted by the breadth of the smartphone, one would be on just messaging applications and services. We're still in the early days of that. Uh, Liz, you've done some great writing on how messaging and publishing is evolving from a broadcast metaphor of uh, Facebook and Twitter where people will curate what they have against a persona versus actually using a smartphone to communicate the way you communicate with your friends. And that would be represented by a Snapchat or a Whisper. And so uh, we believe on the messaging side, uh, there's still a lot of opportunity there to in integrate uh, more visuals and, and make it more uh, dynamic and geocentrically relevant. Uh, the other major trend uh, that we're also focused in on, uh, once again, related to your phone being an effective computational and communication device. If you think of it, it as a personal concierge, you could rethink how you would engage in, in all these different fields. E-commerce in particular is one area I spend a lot of time on, but it also applies to health and wellness, where this personal concierge can be a trusted party that intercepts you at, at the opportune times that could have ma maximal efficacy to help you out. So I encourage you folks to think about um, really making a smartphone a smartphone rather than either a computer or just a, communi or a communication device. You know, that actually brings up an interesting question, I think, for Mark, given that um, once, once you start talking about apps that, that reach deeply into your lives, you start crossing the line between something that an app would be and something that a platform would be, which is where Samsung is sitting and trying to encourage people to develop interesting things, right? Or, or, where do you think are the opportunities there? I mean, I, I totally agree with you guys. I think the concierge angle is exciting, but I haven't seen anyone as an app developer actually make the leap into being a, an integral part of people's lives because it seems like a platform, for instance, like a Google Now kind of thing supersedes that. Yeah, so um, a good example actually that we launched with the, the Note 3 device uh, last month is something called My Magazine. Right, so my magazine is starting to move into this. Uh, one of the things that we talk about internally a lot is being contextually aware. Right, so you, you actually give your phone, in the context of mobile, a lot of information every day. You tell it everyone who you're going to call, you tell it everyone who you're going to message, every photo that you take. And how can you start to take all of that intelligence and turn it around and give the user contextual information? And so my magazine is a great example of that. Um, the Can you describe thing, it a little more? What, so what is my it? magazine is basically there's, um, there's different feeds. There's a social feed, a news feed, a social news, contacts, and messaging. And so these, these four feeds, oh, and then here and now also, which is sort of con, uh, locationally aware. And these five feeds basically give you information based on interests, based on as the phone is learning about you. And so this is where because it's basically, if you, if you have your Note 3, you swipe up and you get to it. This is where you're moving a little bit, in the case of Samsung, away from just an app that you're going to press to open and something that's a little bit more integrated into the platform. I, I mostly uh, spend my time in the enterprise space, but I'm always taken to come to these conferences. How many laptops are actually out there versus iPhones or Samsung devices or... It looks like there's about 3% of you that have an old laptop. So it's mobile first. It's mobile first for consumer, and it's mobile first for the enterprise. And I would contend there's no difference between an enterprise employee worker and a consumer. They're the same persona. They just happen to have different security privileges for what they can do and they can't do. So from an enterprise perspective, about every 10 years you see a sea change in platforms. We're now in the new operating system wars, which are good for startup companies, and so the entire infrastructure for all enterprises has went from a perimeter-based security where they built the Great Wall of China 
for 40 years to there is no Great Wall of China anymore. There is no such thing as the perimeter. So that opportunity for young companies and startups, whether the consumer or enterprise companies, to reinvent security, reinvent analytics, and you know, and use design, beautiful design, simple, easy to use. You know, no training out of the box. Everything should be social. You know, the days of a large enterprise company producing an RFP should have been dead a long time ago. Try my product. If you like it, use it. If you don't like it, go get somebody else's product to use it. So it's a great opportunity uh, for young companies now as people are thinking mobile first. It's driving all the CIOs of large IT companies crazy. We also love that too, but don't let that go outside of the room. It uh, creates a great challenge for them, which is good opportunities for us. But there, there's also certain companies that just exist because of not only mobile first, but the density, right? So we were talking about Waze before we came out here. Waze couldn't have existed three years ago because there just wasn't enough density to know that there was an accident on 101, so you have to go over to 280. And so there's very specific things. So I think Snapchat's a great example in these, these messaging apps. But you can also identify a set of things. I think Waze is one of the best examples. Yeah, I mean, I think that actually is, was the heart of my original question was, was, like, what are the opportunities that are possible now that everyone is using a mobile device that has a lot of capabilities with it, that everyone is commuting their, their, their location or, and I think you're right, like the contextual assistant, the crowdsourced uh, maps or whatever else is going to be crowdsourced are, are, are total, it's kind of on the verge of happening. And I imagine that all three of you are seeing pretty interesting um, new ideas and it's kind of, you know, it's never clear that something that requires such a big audience to work is going to work. You can't necessarily predict that from when you see it, but I'm sure you're seeing interesting ideas that, you know, if people take hold of them, they, they could have a huge impact. Yeah, I mean, I, I would take something that you might not be exactly relevant for what you're describing, but there's a reinvention of the financial services industry. You know, the days of uh, going on some site and trying to get a mortgage loan, uh, we're, we're an investor in a company called Lending Club, which does peer-to-peer -peer lending. It's a marketplace. You get on your phone, you need $10,000, you give them your credit scores, you give them all your information, it takes about five minutes and you get a $10,000 loan. It's matched by a lender. It's way more efficient than a bank and uh, it's simple, easier to get a loan and it's a lot lower interest rate for the borrower that's made possible by speed and mobility and transparency of building these next generation business models that, you know, you, you don't have to be at your desk and you don't have to be at home and God knows you don't have to go to a branch bank because nobody wants to do that. Um, so there's lots of solutions and applications like that that weren't possible uh, uh, just by having that powerful device in your hand. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great example. I mean, there's, um, there's just these, uh, these immense industries that can be kind of innovated as soon as you can have all the data to compute about them, right? Like another example that I thought was um, fun and just taking um, this technology industry mindset into a place I never imagined it was going was recently I, I had been covering this company Climate Corporation which evolved out of Google and they were trying to use uh, data to predict the weather and they didn't really know who was going to pay for that. At first they thought maybe movie sets would pay for it because they'd have to cancel if they couldn't film when there was a rainy day. Um, eventually they found that uh, farmers who are buying insurance might pay for it or the insurance companies were selling to farmers might pay for it and uh, about a month ago I think they were bought for a billion dollars by Monsanto the agriculture company and seeing that kind of spin out of something that starts from all right we have a lot of data what can we do with it to uh, a totally different industry buying you for a billion dollars is it's pretty interesting and I imagine that you know the opportunity for lending club right now is immense I know they're discussed as a IPO candidate pretty soon No comment. <laughs> Let's just sit here for a second and let you think of a comment. He's got a company going public tomorrow. So <laughs> no comment either. <laughs> You're talking trying to either. help my brother here in the venture capital industry. <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody from the SEC here. So. We're talking about Zulily. Yep. It's a commerce company that got invested in. Yeah, one, one thing I would mention, um, not about Zulily, but about the trend that that represents, we, kind of, we think about the phone uh, and cloud-based, the combination of the phone and cloud-based services as enabling richer and more immersive and intensive forms of engagement. And so if you are a, a modern e-commerce company, you could reframe how you're going to interact with your customer. You, you could 
uh, inter touch them many times throughout the day so long as they believe it's a service they want to hear about. And you could tune the communication. So we're moving from this model of, of advertising to acquire a customer's attention, get them to make a decision, and then send them something to developing an ongoing communication relationship with that customer. And, and if you could develop that relationship, uh, the, the customer is more delighted uh, and it's also more profitable for everybody. So, so the platform itself of the cloud-based services, which are very scalable, coupled with um, the maturation of the display on a tablet and a phone, we think really creates um, a very different type of a commerce relationship compared to five years ago. What, and I know, I, I think of, and we were talking about this before, I think of Samsung as potentially the next big platform, though um, the way that that happens is kind of built on top of existing ecosystems, especially on mobile with Samsung on top of Android. But uh, how, I, from your perspective, I know it's a, it's a large company and you don't work, you don't uh, set the tone for all of it, Except on, except today. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what do you think, how, what is Samsung going to learn and, and apply from everyone else kind of going on before it and offering a platform and what can you do now that would be really interesting in this time of pervasive mobile usage? Sure, so, uh, so we can talk about smart TV for a second and then I think the focus of the question is probably mobile. Um, smart TV, we do own our, our own platform. Uh, it's, it's a proprietary Linux-based platform and developers develop specifically for smart TV. Um, so the good news there is that Samsung owns it 100% in terms of being able to evolve the platform in a way that we want to. Um, but at the same time, there's not a broader ecosystem of developers because they, they make a very discreet decision to develop for smart TV. Um, and I think it, that has its, its pluses. It also probably has some, some drawbacks. Um, on mobile, Android has been obviously the big bet we've made, although we've always supported multiple OSs. And we just had our first developer conference uh, two weeks ago in San Francisco. And I think what, what to me that demonstrated was that you actually, as I think Android really wants, is for people to uh, innovate on top of their platform. So on our Note devices, we have a pen or a stylus. And so the S Pen API lets a developer say that if the user is using a note, uh, a note phone, note device, enable that S Pen functionality. Uh, we have other APIs for wallet, we have APIs for um, ads. We, we put lots of sensors also in our phones. So sensors around an S4, there was a humidity sensor, there was a temperature sensor, a pressure, a gyroscope, accelerometer, if the, if the flap is open or shut. And so I think what, what we've been able to do is take Android, which we've been a huge beneficiary of, and Google's been an amazing partner, and, and actually make some, um, put, a, put a sort of Samsung veneer on top of it, which has been, I think, really powerful for our developer community. And at the same time, we get the advantage of accessing the Android developer community, not something just discreet to us. Also, you sell a lot of phones. <laughs> and we sell a lot of phones, which helps, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, what, are, what are you not excited about? What are, I mean, I think um, our premise going into this is like what, what really is coming next in software, but what do people talk about coming next that, that doesn't really seem like it's quite around the corner for you or um, is already here and is just being used as a buzzword to sell billboards? I can tell you from an investing standpoint, what's not exciting is to have an entrepreneur come in and say, you know these five companies that do this in the enterprise, we now do it in the cloud. You know these five companies that do it on a laptop, we now do it on a mobile device. You know, there's got to be, uh, generationally, there's so much more intuitiveness uh, about an application, the ease of use and how it can be delivered and all the information that they have about the end user, the business model innovation. So if you're an entrepreneur, it's just not real exciting for venture people to say, well, you, you had this, now you have... You have that, because it's kind of two, two kinds of investing. There's better, better, faster, cheaper, or there's Brave New World. Um, you can make money doing both, but Brave New World has historically, you know, this is the ideas that you never thought of that create whole new, whole new markets. And I think there's opportunities now to create whole new markets that we didn't think about. And those, I would encourage entrepreneurs to think brave, brave New World as much as you can. 
Yeah, I, I really like that observation, Warren. It, what, what, uh, what we counsel entrepreneurs is that it's a lot easier to be different than it is to be better because uh, you could just be different. And if you are authentic to who you are, uh, it's very hard for someone to copy you. So when an entrepreneur comes in and says that we're X for Y, we're, uh, then we're like, okay, it, uh, why is that? It, what, what's the intention behind what you're going to do that will really delight the customers that you're going to be working with? If you're X for Y, what's wrong with X? And, and, uh, and sometimes you can have something profound that's X for Y, but usually uh, the entrepreneurs that we think and we watch wind up doing very, very well, they do approach it as uh, with this noble intention for how to uh, change the world for the better. That's what entrepreneurs do with an insight that is original to him or her. And those are the ones that are enduring and great. The copycats fail. That's, they do. Or, or they're marginalized. They don't get yeah. much, of, much of a return. Uh, I don't know if there's an area I'm not excited about per se. I think timing is also a tough one. So when you start asking the question, I start thinking about timing. I think about Connected Home is a good example where everyone at Samsung, and I think everyone on this panel would believe in the Connected Home, a smart home. And an analogy that someone drew in just an article this morning was, 10 years ago, no one would have believed that there would be as many smart phones as there are today. And probably 10 years from now, people won't believe there are as many smart homes as there will be then. And I think, the, to me, one of the questions is always the timing. So we sit in 2013, like, when does that happen? Um, for the investors, it's probably a, a bigger consideration, right, because you're, you have some holding period. Um, but I think, to me, timing is always a, a tricky part to, this, to that question. Yeah, we, we have a company that uh, is, in, is in that space that went public, a company called Control4, about three months ago. It's... Uh, kind of a pioneer in home automation. It's an operating system for the home that ties together your, you know, your TVs and your computers and your HVAC systems and your thermostats and your pool pumps. And it's uh, taken about 10 years to get the company to the point where it's at now. And we would have thought this would have happened a long time ago. It's a really hard problem. But I think the cost of uh, integration is, uh, is dropping dramatically. Now, uh, standards are in place, and wireless connectivity is strong enough where it makes, it makes a lot of sense. You say, you know, uh, fire alarm security companies now, you see, you know, uh, everything that could be wireless can be connected, the Internet of Things, I, I kind of call it the Internet of Important Things. I'm not sure if I need my shoes connected to the Internet, but I think Nike thinks I need my shoes. Connected, I, I, I do think generationally... I saw some really cool things about navigating for blind people with connected chairs. Oh, there you go. There you go. Sometimes in the venture business, I feel blind. So, uh, but I, I, think, I do think it will uh, emerge here now. It, it makes sense. Yeah, I, I guess maybe that's a direction to take the conversation that would be interesting to me is to hear how you guys find new things. I mean, you're, you're not completely blind. People come to you, but you also go out there um, and look around. What, what, what's kind of your... You know, for I'm sure there's some companies who would like to approach you here, um, but also, you know, wh what, where do you go looking for interesting new ideas and companies to invest in or work with? Yeah, you, you know, one analogy I do use for that is is a, as a partner at a venture firm like Warren and I are, we wind up making about two investments per year, uh, and we probably hear. Uh, it doesn't mean we meet with these companies, but we probably hear of a couple thousand companies, uh, and, and I'm sure I could ask each of you to name five companies, and several of them I'm sure I wouldn't have heard of. So the, the, the numbers are, uh, uh, are really uh, quite, quite large. One way to prosecute uh, and, and sort through all the signal to noise is just say, well, look, if it's like buying a house, uh, I'll look for what I want to find. And, and if you want to have beachfront property or be in the woods or whatever, um, and so we wind up using this combination of opportunities for how uh, services can evolve coupled with a person doing it. And if the per and, and I, in particular, uh, my personal styles, I like to meet people who I think will be great entrepreneurs regardless of where they're working and try to find something for them to do. And so I've had multi-decade relationships uh, where I've been working with the Zulili team since 1990, 1995. Uh, and that they were at Blue Nile, they were at Fat Brain, two other public companies in the past. Uh, and, and some of the two recent investments I made were folks I'd met uh, several years ago who were gainfully employed elsewhere. And, and when they come 
to, when they come up with an idea that is, from our assessment, quite large, coupled with what they are meant to do, that's when we get very excited. Uh, and, and there are some areas, I thought of an area, uh, Liz, that, that I do find, I, I am sort of jaded about, and, and, and uh, it's around photo apps. So, so uh, photos are indeed very popular, uh, and, uh, and consumers do like to trade photos, but, um, and I'd funded Photobucket a while ago. But uh, when I see another photo app, I do say, yuck. But on the other hand, if it's someone I know, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay attention. But we have to just... I wrote about a photo app this morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, Snapchat's a photo app, and that's a great company, right? So, so it's not that there isn't going to be interesting innovation, but for us, it's a combination of the person coupled with an area I'm exploring. Like, the, the area that's very important to me is one around uh, mindfulness and presence and connecting authentically. So if folks have, are doing innovation there, I just want to hear about it. That's important. I think it's important societally, and I think there's a lot of interesting business opportunities. Have you seen any companies in that area? Uh, uh, so I have seen interesting companies. I was teaching a course at the Stanford Design School uh, for companies in this area, and I told them that all the power to you. I'm not going to fund them. I don't think that there's good businesses doing yeah, this. Yeah, so I know. <laughs> So, uh, but I think someone will crack the code. Feel good, but not a yeah. business. Tricky. Well, I, I mean, just to put a, a, a point on that, one of the dilemmas, uh, w one of the dilemmas with consumerism, of which it powers two thirds of our GDP, and it's very valuable. A lot of consumerism is driven by this uh, this desire of of wa want. You you have this want and you need and you buy something to be satisfied. The dilemma with these mindfulness calming types of apps is that they get you to be feeling very centered and you don't want anything anymore. So it's actually hard to get people to buy these things. I mean, it's just factual. So it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting cognitive uh, dissonance. Type yeah, of there's, a, there's a counterintuitiveness there, but maybe if you're really clever, you could figure it out. I mean, another thing I feel a strong need for would be uh, uh, applications that uh, are anti-distraction applications. I mean, I think it's almost criminal how our, our smartphones and our cars don't work together better now to prevent us from being idiots. And, but, you know, I don't know what the business opportunity is in, like, you know, getting people not to text while driving. Exactly. Yeah, we, we uh, have a, a little seed investment in a company called Automatic. Um, it's like, you I know, just started playing with that. It's yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, I don't know if you've ever seen the progressive insurance commercial. They have this little thing called Snapshot, well, which kind of, you know, how, how fast are you going, what are your miles per hour, or how many miles did you drive, and this thing this uh, device that kind of plugs right into your car takes it to the next level and instruments about everything in your car that you could want to do. So uh, we think there's a really great uh, opportunity. I mean, cars are, have their own identity. Uh, one of my companies has a relationship with Toyota, and Toyota has about six different uh, major applications that come into the car. I'm not even talking about the diagnostic systems now. So they want each one of their cars to have its own security identity um, because somebody starts messing with a car or hacks into your car, that could do some pretty bad stuff. Uh, I, the other thing I would mention, we have one program that for us is a bit unique. We think it's called the Young Entrepreneurs Program. So we have a dozen universities where we hire scouts. These are people getting MBAs or PhDs. We pay them a little bit of money each year to stay connected at the university level on what's happening from an entrepreneurial standpoint. We see literally thousands of companies a year. Uh, these are people that have been in the workforce, now they're back getting an MBA or a PhD. Uh, and it's incredible how astute, how bright they are, and how much they know about venture capital. Uh, and it's been a, good, been a good program for us. So um, yeah, at Samsung, we have a, uh, I have a different advantage, I think, in some ways about thinking about what's interesting, which is actually internal Samsung. So whether it's people who are employees of Samsung, like me, who are meeting with companies, but also a quarter of our workforce is R&D. So you have 25% of people who are focused on actually trying to build the next big thing internally. Uh, we spent $10.8 billion on R&D last year. So for me, being in this open innovation center, and, and it's funny, when it was first named Open Innovation Center, I, I sort of thought to myself, like, I've been in Silicon Valley for a while. It's, it's sort of a not, a, not a goofy name. I don't... I don't mean it that way, but I just, I didn't know what it meant. It's kind really. of a, a words, words name. Yeah, exactly. And, and so what it, what it does mean, and it, it's occurred to me, is that the open part is actually very important. The open is not lab coats and R&D. The open is partnerships, venture investments, M&A, and, and working with the ecosystem. So in Silicon Valley, be, becoming really part of the fabric. And so when you combine those two things, my role 
in open innovation centers, seeing what's out in Silicon Valley and what are people working on, what's the, the next things that are getting funded, um, which entrepreneurs are getting funded combined with, what are the tens of thousands of people inside Samsung working on. It actually ends up being a really great way to triangulate on what's important both for consumers as well as internally at the company. There's a lot of different uh, Samsung uh, offices in the Bay Area, right? You, do you all work together? Uh, so we do. Um, Samsung's legacy in the Bay Area, which probably folks in the room know about, I think we just hit our 25th anniversary here. Um, and most of the folks who are in Samsung here in uh, San Jose, and a lot of it originally, I think this is the legacy, was focused on, again, R&D, uh, people coming over from HQ, from headquarters in Korea, and, and really being in Silicon Valley to uh, both do research, but then also to start to tap into um, entrepreneurs here. Um, in the last year, I think we've, we've maybe tripled down our efforts um, between uh, Young Son, who spoke this morning, opened an office in Menlo Park focused on innovation. Um, we focus, uh, we opened rather an office in Palo Alto and Accelerator, where we took over the, um, the old Varsity Theater. We've also opened an office in New York City, and, and those two spots are really about internal development. So at the beginning, I talked about the four areas of Open Innovation Center and put one aside because it was this internal product development group. Um, that's these two accelerators, one in New York, one in Palo Alto, which are really designed to find uh, proven entrepreneurs who uh, want to take all the advantages that Samsung has to offer, which is distribution footprint, Financial, resource, uh, financial resources, access to product roadmaps, a lot of the shared infrastructure around payroll and insurance, like all the stuff that honestly, like in the formation of a company you think about, right? Am I gonna use ADP or paychecks? How am I gonna get my health insurance? Do I provide 401k or not? Um, but then also uh, shield them from some of the parts of a big company. So if you're a six person startup, you say I'm gonna be uh, nimble, I'm going to move fast, I'm going to be autonomous. So what we do is we give those folks a budget um, and they build the product that they would want to build if they were a startup. Um, so again, that's just one example of how I think we're doubling down in Silicon Valley. So speaking of uh, startup accelerators, that is a rapidly expanding phenomenon. Um, all over the world, there are places where you can go kind of take a class and get a tutor to help you start a company. Um, usually a short-term program, right? Um, how does that, how do you think that's changed um, the, everything that comes after starting a company? Uh, have you noticed anything significant as, as, as companies come through accelerators grow up or as people trained in accelerators join other companies or move on or, or does that trickle up through the system? So, so I can just describe our model quickly and then you guys will probably be able to talk more about the the classic definition of accelerator. Um, our accelerator in some ways probably needs a lowercase a um, because it's not the model that you described where there's a prescribed period of time and a prescribed set of funding. Uh, what, what we've said is the, the way we are going to um, differentiate Samsung on software and actually integrate the hardware and softwares is we want those people to be part of Samsung. What we wanted to create was an environment where they could build the products that consumers would love, the same ones that entrepreneurs are building here, but to do it as part of Samsung. So our program doesn't have a prescribed period of time. Uh, people join as employees, and they could be in this accelerator for 12 months, 18 months, maybe 24 months, being a normal employee, um, building a product, and then at some point, effectively exit it or sell it into the, into the business unit. Um, so that's what, that's what we're seeing. So in, in some ways, we have shielded these entrepreneurs from everything which is startup-like in terms of needing to go fundraise, needing to go figure out all the things about starting a company uh, because we want them to be part of Samsung. So basically you take a job at Samsung but you don't know what you're going to do. You figure something out once you get there. So, so the first part's true, uh, meaning that they take a job at Samsung. The second part is the way we've done recruiting into the accelerators. Typically people come to us. We don't go to them. We don't have a set of PRDs that are sitting in the conference room and say, hey, do you want to build our you know, photo app that disappears in eight seconds, right? Um, eight they come, seconds. That's eight, so innovative. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, nine seconds. <laughs> um, instead, what we've done is basically met with people who have ideas. Usually, they're people who have started companies before, have either had success or not, quite frankly, 
and know what it, know what it means to be an entrepreneur and knows what it takes to find that success. Um, we usually bring them in. They might have two ideas, three ideas that we um, say, let's whittle that down to one over the course of the first month to six weeks. And then once we all agree on a, an idea that is fundable, call it, then we put together a budget and they start to hire a team. And so they don't come in with no idea. We come in with sort of some general idea of what we'll probably work on together, and then they focus in on it sometime after they've joined. It, 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 and, and what strikes me, Liz, is that there, there really are, are uh, two forces that seem notable to me that are really creating the opportunity for accelerators, which can make uh, a lot of sense. And those two forces for entrepreneurs out there are just that, number one, um, it's cheaper and cheaper every single year to start up a company. It's a deflationary industry. And so for a limited pool of capital, you can get a lot done. And some entrepreneurs would estimate that uh, it's one thirtieth the cost of starting up a company today compared to like 1999 and the last heyday, a lot of uh, innovation um, in terms of numbers of companies. And the second one is, um, is, uh, is the transparency of information around starting up a company and learning ways and how to get those companies going along with uh, aggregating resources, either people or funding. So, uh, so in that, if there are a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs who could get something done. They know that they can get access to information pretty easily. And so how do you do that as quickly as possible? So a number of the accelerators are filling that void along with providing uh, the, the plug of capital to get them going. And, and so uh, we, we think it's a great trend. It helps uh, entrepreneurs be able to pursue what they want to pursue. Uh, it's increasing the level of sophistication for the entrepreneurs, which is great. It does, we think, materially change the landscape for, uh, for the role of early stage venture capital firms. We, we think deeply about what does that mean? How do we complement the current ecosystem with the skills and resources that we have that would be um, additive to what they're up to? It, it, it's, it, it for sure has changed our perspective of the industry. So what do you not do that you used to do? The... the um, the, what, one of the major distinctions is um, is helping an entrepreneur think more clearly around his or her alternatives for financing strategy. So, so uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you do want to think about the fundamental value of the company, which is creating profits and delighting customers, right? It, that, that's the fundamental value. There's strategic value. You can acquire an audience and be acquired by a larger company, as an example. Uh, depending upon what your long-term goals are, you could say, do I want to fail fast, learn, uh, be a lean startup, put a minimum amount of dollars for a minimum viable product, or do you want to build something larger that may be monolithic, that may succeed or may, may fail? It, you cannot uh, develop an, an iPhone on a $200,000 uh, incubated accelerator uh, investment. It just won't happen. So I, I, so I think there is a lot of jargon in this plethora of all this information we have out there, some of which is misinterpreted and confusing. So from our point of view, it's like, how do we just improve the accuracy and precision of what's being said and help the entrepreneurs understand what their range of alternatives are and find what's most appropriate? I mean, I like to say at, at all the places I speak that I think most great businesses don't really need venture capital. I don't think it's the right funding strategy for most companies. So pause, stop. I mean, and, and it's fashionable, but is it right and wise? And, and so we're happy to engage in those discussions. I, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I think that uh, it all comes down to mentorship, not getting money. I spend most of my life talking out of people taking investments from people like me because it's just not the right thing to do. You know, it's not going to be a big enough company. The idea is not big enough. It doesn't mean they can't make money at it or they can't make a good living at it, but it's, it's just going to send them down the wrong path. And so their job is to get customers and build product, not to go raise money. Money is just an outcome that you get to do if you're going to be successful. But if your thought is, I'm going to raise money and raise money, raise money, then you never really build a real company. So uh, we focus on very similar. And it's great to have all these accelerators out there because it – levels the playing field for someone that might come especially from a developing country or a background they couldn't possibly get a shot at doing a startup and for very little they can put their idea to work and try to make their dream happen so that part's terrific the, the thing that we won't do is you know kind of what I would call create a jump ball let's get you know 15 venture capitalists and we'll all put in a hundred thousand dollars each and then 
we can all rummage around and find out whether or not we really want to help the entrepreneur. To me, it's all about helping the entrepreneur be successful. It's about aligning our passion with their passion and creating a relationship that has intellectual honesty. You, you can't do that if you don't have enough skin in the game and you're not going to spend enough time with the entrepreneur. And we just, there's no way to scale ourselves personally. That's, the, that's one of the incredibly frustrating things about this job is you only got so much time and if you're going to do a high quality job, you have to take care of the people that you invested in first. And if you make a commitment to make an investment, whether it's a dollar or $20 million, it's the same level of commitment. If you're an entrepreneur, that's what I would look for. Not just the firm that you're going to do business with, but who's the person? What's their background? Have they walked a mile in your shoes? Do they have the experience? You know, they made the mistakes before because we, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and people say, wow, you're a venture capitalist. That's like being a rock star. And I said, you ought to have a helmet cam on me and watch me all day long because I deal with lots of problems all day long. That's what startups have. They have challenges. So, um, uh, I think it's nice to have the accelerators, and hopefully they'll get the mentorship, and a few will make it like, like others do in the venture business to be great companies. So what's something that you have seen, um, either a product or a company recently, that just captured your imagination, something that you thought was pretty exciting? It better be something we invested in. <laughs> I, I would. Uh, I'm, I'm giving you free space to blurb something. Oh my something. God! This is. I'm just, God, you, just venture, you have to justify. You it. give a venture capitalist time to gloat about their companies. We this could turn into about six hours of. Uh, um, I said one. I won. Okay, so I, I won't name the company. Uh, it is a, a an idea for end users to build their own analytics based upon English questions. Uh, you're able to convert uh, essentially a business question into real-time business metadata, no IT department, no data warehouse, uh, incredibly graphical, all done in a SaaS world. I think if you ask most people about business intelligence or data warehousing or whatever you want to call it, it's one person knows how to do the complex query report or analytical application and 5,000 or 20,000 people use it and they'll go, the data's wrong and that's not the question I really wanted to ask. So. It's really empowering the end user with a new computing paradigm uh, that they don't, they don't need IT intervention to do it. So very What's excited. What's that called? It's called Vizier is the name of the company. They're the original inventors invented a product called Crystal Reports years ago. Yeah, they're up in Vancouver. A, a gentleman named John Schwartz, who was the CEO at Business Objects, is the founding CEO and team. And I, I personally spent... I ran two business intelligence companies, one public, one private, and it's time for that whole thing to change. Now. Great. I'm happy to go if you want to uh, think more. So I will plug a Samsung product, uh, which is the, the gear, uh, the watch. And, you know, when I, when I first started hearing about it, I thought, oh, it could be interesting, right? But, it, but I have my phone, right? And I just sort of, I, I grab my phone out of my pocket, and, and that's fine. And, and the gear, which I joked, Earlier, uh, earlier today, my four-year-old stole last night from me, and I, and I couldn't find it this morning, and he wouldn't tell me where it was. Uh, and the reason was because he loves taking the photos. He loves the, the little like, psh noise when he takes the photo and feels like Spider-Man. Um, but, but to me, it's, it's partly about the gear and about the watch and the functionality and the notifications, and it's partly about what that can be. Um, and when we think about connected life, connected home, smart accessories, Internet of Things, like all the stuff that you kind of extrapolate out, to me this is a very tangible example where I can start to get my head around what does that mean in the future? What does it mean if there are certain sensors in a device like this or even on your shoes, right? Like maybe the, maybe the, the blind person analogy is actually a really good one because it's a killer use case, right, for something like that. So to what me... Have the, you, what have you done with your gear? Like what's a gear experience you've had so far where it would have been better, it would, it would not have been better to use your phone? So... So it's not like this, I hesitate to answer, the, I mean, I will answer the question, but I, I, I don't have a great answer because it's, it's not like earth shattering, but it's the same thing that I remember when I was 10 years old and we had cable TV, I had a little, um, the, the way you changed the channels was you had this little thing that slid along, if you remember, it had like channels 2 through like 30, or probably 2 through 12, I don't even remember, and you kind of slid it along and now I have this fancy EPG on my TV and like functionally it's the same. Right? I change channels on my TV today like I did then. Um, but there's something about not having to take my phone out of my pocket, open it up, hit the lock screen, hit OK, pull down, see notifications, oh, I have a new email, oh, I have a whatever. 
and just see it here as it comes in, which is extremely powerful. Yeah, and, and, and for me, I, uh, uh, I don't like to talk about any company I've met, and my companies prefer to keep what they're doing to be trade secrets. So I was just going through my head of like, what could I talk about? I used to, many years ago, always have one company that was my favorite company that I knew nothing about, and therefore I could tell about tell audiences how much I like companies like cheeseburger.com or, or uh, Chat Roulette and others. Um, I, I think that, that the, the part, the general area, since, I, since all the instantiations I can think of are companies I've met, and I don't feel comfortable sharing any uh, observation about them, is just that uh, pay, pay close attention to how you actually uh, message and engage with people in deeper ways. And, and I just think that there's a lot of interesting innovation, a lot of interesting startups doing that. And, and when you hear about traction of companies uh, like a Snapchat today or some other companies, there, there's a cohort, there's a segment of customers where it really speaks to that to that consumer, and um, and we're in the really early days. When you think about consumer trends, uh, uh, and and maybe this is a broad uh, observation for any consumer company you're thinking about how to decompose it. Um, many consumer trends start out as utilities, like uh, Google uh, Gmail is a utility, uh, the uh, Model T Ford is a utility, the Dell IBM PC were utilities. Consumers get bored with utilities. They want to be entertained. So you go from the Model T Ford to General Motors, you go from uh, the, uh, the um, Dell computer to the Apple, um, and, and so you're going to see uh, Facebook going to something else, you're going to see Gmail going to something else. And, uh, and I think it will be around how people relate to each other. And there's going to be a lot of innovation there. So you think a utility is a stepping stone for a, a better version of it that's more fun or more entertaining? Yes, yes. Uh, whenever there's a utility, like the telephone, I, when the telephone was vented back in 1893 or around that time period, folks thought it would be used for business to business, but it wound up being used for neighbors to talk to each other in, in entertaining ways. We are social beings, we like to relate, we have a smartphone. And so I just think that there's a lot of innovation to expect that any, any area where there's a, a, a horizontal, broadly used application like Box or, um, or uh, Dropbox, those are vibrant uh, solutions but they're gonna be analogs that are entertainment related. And then there'll be a leadership entertainment one and then you'll see fragmentation. It's always the case in entertainment that there'll be some juggernaut that defines the category, like reality TV. But then subsequent uh, generations will have niches within that. And, and if you use TV as an example, the broad niches are all many, many, many times bigger than the original networks. And that's the beauty about consumer entertainment. And I think early, we're in the very early days of mobile, of phone and, and tablet entertainment. So those platforms that enable it, those platforms that uh, can actually directly entertain can be very, very valuable. Do, we have some time now, I think, for audience questions and perhaps someone can bring you a mic, I believe. Um, can you raise your hand if you have one? Go ahead. Well, I don't need a microphone. Great. Uh, um, Warren, you, you mentioned a brave new world, and uh, that means disruption. Where do you see the next technology disruption coming from? Maps? Yeah, the question is, uh, where do I see the next technology disruption coming from based upon kind of brave new world? The beauty of my job is I don't have to Think about that. I have great entrepreneurs. <laughs> they think all think of that. I, 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 I'm saying this a little bit tongue in cheek. I, I think about it a lot. My personal style is not to fund my own ideas. I found that to be a very dangerous way to get myself in trouble. There are so many bright entrepreneurs. There are so many great ideas. I think you know, with the internet and mobility, uh, global. You know, we've talked about the social, the big data. There's just so many game-changing ideas out there. I couldn't tell you one. I, I participated one in the last decade that was to create the largest smart grid company in the world to connect homes and businesses using the Internet as a backbone to do that. Um, one of the reasons I love my job is I get to talk to smart people all day like you that have better ideas than I do.
to Verizon. And, oh, sorry. You know the gear that you're speaking about? So I went to Verizon to, to actually purchase the gear. But the watch itself is tailored just for the guys. Do you know if you're going to come up with something for... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, all the ladies here. That's right? a big idea. <laughs> uh, I don't, actually. But I'm happy to find out. Oh, thanks. So, if you want I just wrote about a, um, a Kickstarter project last week that was a notification watch just for women, um, which didn't have a screen and it looks like a, a metal bangle of jewelry. Um, so I think, I think people are realizing that that is a vastly ignored market. Um, but I would say what I've seen so far has been very first generation, but the men's stuff is pretty ugly too. <laughs> One more question? So I, I appreciate that you brought up wearables. We're seeing that as a huge trend. And I think the other thing that we're seeing, and I would love the audience to comment about it, is you know, there's a lot more that's going on with wearables, perceptual computing, and robotics, uh, and you know, connected toys and all of that. Thank you. Um, so my, my question was, uh, you know, I'd like the uh, panel to comment about wearables, robotics, uh, and connected toys, and, and what you're seeing coming in that space. Yeah, yeah maybe I'll start. Uh, on, uh, on wearables and connected devices, uh, we, we, we believe that that, uh, that trend is going to accelerate. Uh, at the same time, we feel that it's more of a big company game. Uh, you could look at the Nike Fuel Band, probably outselling all of its peers 5x, uh, perhaps I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, large companies have the resources for distribution and other advantages. Uh, and um, and from a uh, venture back standpoint, uh, working capital required for hardware is a little bit more expensive, and and so larger companies have that advantage. With respect to connected toys, uh, our point of view is that that will be quite innovative, but early. Uh, uh, once again, because of the hardware component of it and. Uh, the dilemma with entertainment is that there there can be a hits driven aspect to it, and so if you do hardware and it 's a fail you, you lose a lot of money so so uh, a lot of potential, but it feels early to us did you see the the anki drive that came out last week that's that 's the coolest thing i 've seen in that category it's uh, it 's a n k i um, and it 's a artificially intelligent car racing game that kind of takes the cars off the screen in front of you, the gaming console, and they're actually physical cars that race around a track on your floor. Um, I think it costs about $200, and I would say from using it for a couple minutes, the major downside I saw was that they run out of batteries after about a half an hour of play. But it is so neat to just put down the two cars on the track and have them automatically sense each other and they start doing racing patterns and you can race your own car against an artificially intelligent car. It's stuff I hadn't seen anything like that before. Except on a screen, on a flat screen where you're just seeing the, you know, the computer and the graphics. Uh, there's a lot of talk about disruption of education and learning these days. And I notice there's uh, been growing amount of money uh, pouring in from uh, the venture industry, particularly in this area, to a lot of entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs who want to do something for learning and, and education. So I'd love to uh, have uh, some comments from you, both about what you see here, and I'm curious about whether Samsung is uh, interested in that. And, of course, you can think of tablets and all kinds of devices that could be used for that. But uh, any comments that uh, you have on that would yeah, be appreciated. I can, I can take you. that one first. So we had a company go public uh, two days ago called Chegg. It's a chicken and egg, which comes first. And the entrepreneur's original vision was, why buy your college textbook when you can rent it to someone and that it can be used over and over again? Um, and then the business basically evolved into the digital experience for the student. How do I pick a professor? How do I get homework help? Um, how do I design my best major? How do I share notes with other people in class? And I, I got to believe everyone in this room believes education's got to get reinvented. It's so beyond broken. 
And, uh, you know, people like Samsung building great uh, devices, the ubiquity of, of these devices all over the world can reinvent education. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting stuff that takes place in education technology. I would just say from an entrepreneur's expect, uh, what, I would watch, what I'd watch out for is make sure you can make money at it. Yeah, the, the public market seemed to fall out of lo love with they tech did. very fast. Uh, they did. You know, it's been public for two days. It's down 25 or 30 uh, percent. We're long-term investors. We think it's a big market, great team. I, you know, we don't control the stock market. So um, if we did, that'd be a good business. That'd be a breakthrough. <laughs> that'd be a really breakthrough business. But I, but I, I do think there's, there's some great opportunities there. Selling to universities is really hard, but engaging consumers and students directly and parents is a great business model. Uh, you know, from, from my perspective, I would wrap um, education up a little bit with healthcare, retail, government to, into sort of the enterprise side of Samsung. I think it's a great point. I mean, there's an opportunity for us to sell more hardware, right? If we start to have these um, tablets, really tablets be the default mechanism by which uh, students are learning in school. Um, but, you know, separate from from that piece, I think what I observe is things like Khan Academy, things like uh, Udacity, things, right? Th this whole notion of sort of open courseware, whatever you want to call it, I think is, is the really exciting thing, again, from a consumer standpoint, from the standpoint of enabling learning. Those to me are just really exciting things that in large part are enabled by having all these devices in people's hands. So you talked a lot about different uh, investment focus areas, such as you know healthcare, education, wearables. You haven't talked a whole lot about retail and commerce, which is obviously a very big market. And Gus, you have a company going public right now. So I was wondering if you guys have seen any real disruption in the commerce area, both from B2C side, consumer side, and also the B2B side as well. Yeah, and, and was it specifically on, on mobile commerce in particular? Was that... Uh Omnichannel commerce, really. E-commerce, yeah. mobile commerce, yeah, social yeah, commerce. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, there, we, uh, we, we think that there's a lot of innovation going on in, uh, uh, in e-commerce, especially movement of physical goods. And, and the large trend is that, um, that consumers are much more uh, ready to purchase, uh, purchase on the phone. And so that, that's been a major transformation. One of my portfolio companies, MoveWeb, helps uh, Fortune 100 companies more quickly uh, have a responsive web design for their phone uh, because uh, the consumer demand moved from like Q1 of last year uh, of maybe 5% of the commerce was by the phone to like 40% in Q4 and folks were just caught off guard. So when you think through uh, that folks are willing to purchase, what other information do they need? What other reassurances? What brand proposition do you have? That creates a lot of opportunity. The other element that we're also seeing that's innovative at a broad level, because um, I'm thinking of a couple specific companies, um, and I don't want to talk about what they're doing, is that, um, that you can have many more people engaged in shopping concurrently. And so uh, you can have this broadcast mechanism, and, ha and that's one of the benefits of having a platform all these phones. If you're broadcasting something and you have an interactive in discussion with them, either by texting or by tweeting with responsive tweets, you'll actually get a critical mass of people who provide feedback. There was a friend of mine that started a company that he sold and he would uh, take the items he wanted to merchandise and put them up on Twitter and say, A, B test, which one do you want? And there was a huge, they, they, there was like 10,000 folks who would sign in on a period of time and tweet out their responses, not 10,000 tweets, but audience of 10,000. So you get really interesting customer feedback from those types of relationships and you get a, a, a more loyal customer base. So think of, the, th once again, think of intercepting your customer anywhere and asking for his or her help to make your service better and you'll find people who want to do that. Well, great. Uh, thank you very much. All right, I'd like to invite the next panel up to the stage, and in the meantime, if you'd like some dessert, um, there's some right over there. <laughs> okay.
perfect. Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Yes. 